introduce here an item set because we just did two kind of like essay type problems or problem type problems. Now you should see an item set about how they could possibly test this material. And it'll also give you an, a good indication of how they integrate the material from different readings or different concepts from different readings into an item set. So therefore I keep saying this over and over again. If you're going to walk into this exam expecting some kind of pure item set all the time, the only pure item sets you're going to get are going to be like ethics. That's a guarantee. But you really shouldn't be expecting to go in there and say, oh, they're going to give me a whole item set on forwards, futures, and options and swaps. No, they might just integrate the stuff with stuff from economics, fixed income, or equity. Again, and they'll still call it on the front page equities item set. You got to look at everything holistically. You can't just real learn everything compartmentalized. I want to go over the swaps. So we're going to move over from forwards and futures to swaps. And we're going to do the swaps material. And then after the swaps material, I'll do the options. And then I'm going to combine the swaps with the options and go over what we call swaptions. And that should conclude everything that we need in the derivatives material. All right. Well, you have to keep in mind here that there's a difference between price and value. Okay, so that's the key point here, is that the price of a contract and the value of a contract are not necessarily or are not going to be the same. So again, the distinction here between the price and the value of a swap is the same idea as what we say with a forward contract. For example, with a forward contract, what is the value of the forward contract at initiation? The value of the forward contract at initiation is zero okay or what is the value of futures contract at initiation zero but does that mean that the price of the forward contract is zero no the price of the forward contract is whatever the price was that was locked in if the forward price is 54 dollars, then that's what you're agreeing as the long side to pay at the time of delivery at the end of the forward contract so price and value are not the same the value of a forward contract again is zero at initiation so remember that the price of a forward contract is the forward rate that yields a zero value for that forward contract at initiation. That is what exactly what I just said. And then after, after contract initiation, as rates change, as interest rates change or prices change, that contract will either have value to the long side or it'll have value to the short side. That's with the forward contract. But again, remember with a forward contract, everything is settled at maturity or at expiration. So that's with regard to a forward contract. Now, with a swap, here's what you need to know. With a swap, at initiation, the value of the swap will be zero to both the floating rate payer and the fixed rate payer. Why would the value of a swap be zero at initiation? Because what happens is if you were to enter into a swap knowing that the other side has an advantage from the beginning, would you ever enter into that swap? Probably not. So therefore, we have to say that the present value of the fixed rate payments and the present value of the floating rate payments must be the same at initiation. In other words, the present value must be, must be the same, so the present value has to be equal to zero. So the value of a swap at initiation is zero. The value of the swap at maturity, at the end, at the, t at the, at the end of the life of the swap, is also zero once the final payments are made. The value of a swap on any settlement date is also zero once the, once the, uh, the uh, payments are swapped, okay? So then if the swap has a value, keep, notice how I keep saying the word value of zero at initiation, at, at, at the end, at maturity, and on any settlement date, when does the swap have value? The swap will have value between settlement dates, between day zero and day 90, between day 91 and day 180, between day 181 and day 270, and so on and so forth. So the swap will have value between settlement dates, and then on any settlement date, and at maturity and initiation, it will have a value of zero. Okay, that's very, but that is very different than the price of the swap. What is the price of the swap? The price of the swap is the swap fixed rate, whatever the fixed rate is that the fixed rate payer is paying on that swap. And we're going to see how that swap fixed rate is determined in a moment. Okay, so at initiation of the swap, the fixed rate is selected so that the present value of the floating rate payments, as I said, is equal to the present value of the fixed rate payments, which means again that the swap has a value of zero at initiation to both parties. And the swap fixed rate is what we call the price of the swap. So that is the idea here between the value 
the, val the, the, uh, price, the difference between the pricing and the value of the swap. Now, before we just simply jump in and start going over how to come up with a swap fixed rate and showing you all these numbers and all, what you need to understand is you need to have a little bit of a, now that you understand that there's a difference between the pricing and the value of a swap, is to understand the differences between some of these swaps like a plain vanilla interest rate swap and a currency swap, okay? Take a look. If you take a look at your screen right now, I want to actually go over a plain vanilla interest rate swap. So I put up this plain vanilla interest rate swap on your screen between a bond dealer and an insurance company, okay? So let's go over this so that you can uh, be clear about how a plain vanilla interest rate swap works and then how a currency swap works and then we'll start moving into how the swap fixed rate is determined. All right, let's say you're a bond dealer, okay? And as a bond dealer, like Solomon Brothers was back in the 80s and the 90s, bond dealer, you want to create an inventory of bonds. You're a bond dealer, so you need an inventory of bonds and you would like to create a $100 million inventory of bonds. Well, that's nice, but where are you going to get $100 million from? Well, because of your reputation and because you're well known, some banks or consortium of banks, but I'll just call it here a bank, is willing to lend you the $100 million and they are going to charge you, the bond dealer, the, the, an interest rate on the $100 million at, at, at an interest rate, we're just going to call it LIBOR flat for simplicity in terms of math, okay? they're going to charge you a rate of LIBOR. And we're going to say that LIBOR initially is at the time that you borrow this money, 5%. Okay, so the LIBOR rate today, time equals zero, is 5%. So what the bond dealer will do is they'll borrow the $100 million from the bank at, at an interest rate right now of 5%. Remember, LIBOR is fluctuating. The London Interbank Offer Rate is fluctuating. And then they're going to buy $100 million worth of bonds, and they're going to call that bonds inventory. And they're going to buy a whole bunch of different bonds. And what the bond dealer has been able to determine is that on this inventory bonds, whether interest rates go up or interest rates go down, they will be the weighted average coupon. The weighted average coupon on all the bonds is 7.5%. And that's a fixed rate of interest on an annual basis. So from the inventory, they're earning a weighted average coupon of 7.5%. But then to the bank, they're having to pay an, an, an annual interest rate of LIBOR which today started out, starts out at 5%. And we're gonna assume that they're gonna enter into a swap and that everything is being done on a semi-annual basis. Everything is gonna to have to be divided by two. Hold on, I'm just pointing this, pointing this out to you. So the bond dealer has a problem. What is the bond dealer's problem? On, their, on the money that they borrowed from the bank, they are paying a floating rate of interest, but on their bonds, on the inventory that they've created, they're earning a fixed rate of interest. Well, they are vulnerable to interest rate risk. They're gonna be vulnerable to changes in interest rates, especially if interest rates go up. And if interest rates go up above 7.5%, the cost of financing, which is what they're borrowing from the bank set, is gonna be greater than the return they're getting on those bonds. So they are afraid that interest rates might go up above 7.5%. That's why in that diagram I'm showing you if interest rates go up, there's like a, a frowning phase. The bond dealer would not be happy. So obviously the bond dealer is vulnerable to interest rate risk, when interest rate, especially when interest rates go up above 7.5%. <clears throat> now let's say on the opposite side of the spectrum, this bond dealer has a client, an insurance company, and this insurance company also is doing business. And what they do is they have $100 million worth of premiums that are sitting in the bank. And the bank is paying the insurance company uh, a floating rate of interest, again, called LIBOR, the London Interbank Offer Rate. Now remember, in the real world, you would never get to pay just LIBOR. It would be LIBOR plus what we call a, plus a spread or LIBOR plus what we call a quoted margin. Quoted margin is what we call the spread. And But on the other hand, even though they're earning LIBOR on those idle cash reserves, those premiums that are sitting in the bank, the insurance company knows that they have a fixed cost of doing business. So in other words, they have sat down with their actuaries and they have basically figured out that, you know what, in order to do their business, they have insurance agents. These insurance agents have to go out to customers and they have to cold call customers. They have to sit down with customers. They have to show them all the different types of life insurance policies, suggest one, answer questions, come back, answer questions again, keep calling them, then finally bring the contract over, get them to sign it, get, pick up the check, all this back and forth, back and forth, just to sell a insurance contract. Nobody just comes in one day and says, 
signs the insurance contract, gives a check, and moves out. It's very unusual. So there's going to be a lot of, if you will, fixed costs of writing these policies, these whole life policies, term policies, variable life, universal variable life, what, GICs, fixed annuities, whatever it may be. And the insurance company, along with its actuaries, have determined that they're, that the actual fixed cost of doing their business is about 6%. We're going to call that the actuarial requirement because that's what the actuaries have indicated. They have a fixed cost of doing business of 6%. The life insurance company does. So the life insurance company also has a problem, just like the bond dealer. They're vulnerable to interest rate risk. However, the insurance company is concerned when interest rates go down. If interest rates go down below, if you will, 6%. Why? Because if interest rates go down below 6%, they still have a fixed cost of doing business of 6%, but they're earning less and less on those idle cash reserves. So in other words, the insurance company is vulnerable to interest rate risk when interest rates go down, and the bond dealer is vulnerable to interest rate risk when interest rates go up. So they both are vulnerable to interest rate risk, so somehow they would like to mitigate their exposure to interest rate risk. <clears throat> now here's the key point. When we're looking at forwards and futures, as we saw before, it's a zero-sum game. One side wins, one side loses by the same amount. And a futures contract obligates the, account the parties to act. With a swap, some people also call it a zero-sum game in the sense that one side is making a payment and the other side is receiving the payment, but it is essentially not necessarily a zero-sum game because in a swap, as you're gonna see in a moment, both parties can benefit from the swap. In other words, you might still have a payment from one side to the other, but both sides could be benefiting from the swap. And it is better, especially at level two, to look at swaps, even though swaps can be for speculative purposes, like betting on whether something's gonna go up or whether something's gonna go down, but it's better in order to understand the valuation of swaps, it's better to look at swaps as a risk management tool. Again, it can be used for speculation, but it, it, swaps can be used for speculation, but in order to understand the valuation of swaps, it's better to look at swaps from a risk management tool because that's gonna help you also in level three. So what the bond dealer can do is the bond dealer can basically say or propose to its client, the insurance company, to enter into a plain vanilla interest rate swap in which the bond dealer would say, well, you know what, we're getting 7.5% fixed on an annual basis from the underlying inventory of bonds that we have, so we can be the fixed rate payer in the swap. And the insurance company that's receiving LIBOR on its idle cash reserves at the bank, and that's a floating rate of interest, can't afford to pay the LIBOR rate, which is a floating rate to the bond dealer. So that's how this swap could be structured. The bond dealer can offer this swap structure to the insurance company, which is its client, in which the bond dealer would pay a fixed rate of 7.5% on an annual basis and receive a LIBOR on an annual basis. All right, so that's how this would be a fixed for floating, fixed for floating, which is what we call a plain vanilla interest rate swap. Now, all of this is based on a notional principle of $100 million, okay? So there's no exchange being done of the notional principle. That's why they call it a notional principle because the bond dealer isn't gonna send the insurance company $100 million and then the insurance company is going to send the bond deal $100 million. Doesn't really, all they're going to swap is the net interest payments. One side will be making a net payment to the other. <clears throat> That's the extent of it. So now what we need to figure out is who would make the first payment, how much and when. Since this is a six month or semi-annual settling swap as I told you earlier, the bond dealer is going to have to make what kind of payment? A fixed rate payment of 7.5% annually, half of that is 3.75. So every six months, the bond dealer on the swap would owe the insurance company $3,750,000. How did I get that? $100 million notional principal times 7.5 divided by two. And you can see the math at the bottom of that same screen. So the bond dealer would owe the insurance company $3,750,000 every six months because they know their fixed rate payments in advance because it's fixed. On the other hand, what would the floating rate payer, meaning the insurance company, owe after six months? Well, floating rate payments are always paid in arrears. LIBOR is paid in arrears. What do I mean by arrears? We determine the rate today 
and today's rate will get paid out on day whatever on the next settlement date. So since the next settlement date is on day 180, the 5% that is the LIBOR interest rate today of 5%, as I told you, will get paid out on day 180. And whatever the LIBOR rate is on day 180 will get paid out on day 360. And whatever the LIBOR rate is on day 360 will get paid out on day 540. But of course, only half of the amount because it's a annual interest rate, but we're dealing with semi-annual periods. So since the LIBOR rate at the beginning of the period, meaning time equals zero, is equal to 5%, the insurance company would have to pay half of that, which is 2.5%. 2.5% on 100 million would be 2,500,000. So in other words, on day 180, at the first six month settlement period, the bond dealer would owe 3,750 to the insurance company, and the insurance company would owe 2,500,000 based on LIBOR at the beginning of the period. That's why we say that LIBOR always settles or floating repayments settle in arrears. The rate today gets paid on the next settlement date. And therefore, because the bond dealer owes more by 1,250,000 on day 180, the bond dealer would make a check or they would forward money of 1,250,000 to the insurance company. Okay. So that would be, now does that mean that the insurance, that the bond dealer is going to owe 1250000 on day 360? No, because it all depends on what happens to interest rates. As interest rates keep going, if interest rates keep going up, 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 the bond dealer is still going to only pay 3750 every six months, but they're going to start to get what? More floating rate payments. And eventually by turnaround that the insurance company has to make a payment to the bond dealer. It all depends on interest rates because the bond dealer is afraid that interest rates are going to go up and wants to be protected, whereas the insurance company is afraid that interest rates are gonna go down and wants to be somewhat protected. So now let's see, even though in this first six month period, the bond dealer would make a net payment to the insurance company of $1,250,000, let's see how both sides benefited from this swap. Well, let's take a look at it from the bond dealer's perspective. The bond dealer is getting 7.5% on an annual basis, from the inventory and then it's paying out seven and a half percent on an annual basis as a fixed rate on the swap that nets out then there the bond dealer is receiving LIBOR from the insurance company on an annual basis and then it's paying LIBOR to the bank on an annual basis inflow outflow inflow outflow so basically net net the bond dealer has a zero net exposure so in other words, what the bond dealer has succeeded in doing is even though in the first six months they have to make a payment, the bond dealer has mitigated its exposure to interest rate risk. At the end of the day, when they close their books, there is no net interest here, okay? Because whatever is coming in is going out. So it's, a net, it's all netting out. And that's what happens here. So the bond dealer has completely mitigated its exposure to interest rate risk. Now, what about the insurance company? The insurance company is receiving LIBOR from the bank and paying out LIBOR, cash in, cash out. But then they're receiving 7.5% from the bond dealer and that's covering their 6% fixed cost of doing business, that actuarial requirement. So the insurance company has benefited from this swap because they have locked in a spread of 150 basis points, 1.5%. The difference between 7.5 and 6% on a annual basis. So over the life, over the tenor of this swap, the bond dealer has done what? Mitigated their exposure to interest rate risk and the insurance company has basically earned a spread. The spread between the fixed rate that they're receiving and the fixed rate that they are paying out of 150 basis points. So therefore, they, and that's what insurance companies are many times trying to do, earn a spread on their investments to cover all the payments that they have to make to others on fixed annuities and GICs to their clients. GICs meaning guaranteed investment contracts, fixed annuities, and the like. Okay, so now we see the benefit to the bond dealer. We see the benefit to the insurance company. Both are actually benefiting from this swap. Well, you might say, but Nathan, I don't get it. The bond dealer paid $1,250,000 in the first six months, and they have a zero exposure to interest rate risk because interest rate risk has been mitigated. Does the bond dealer make any money in this? Well, of course, the bond dealer is gonna make money if interest rates keep rising and rising and rising, but the bond dealer is also making money in a different way. Who structured this deal? Who structured this swap? The bond dealer did. What this company like I, and that's, I, I worked a number of years ago for Solomon Brothers, we, they actually established a company when I was there called Swapco. Swapco, which only did swaps, why? 
because Solomon Brothers wanted to enter into this very lucrative business of swaps, very lucrative as you'll see in a moment, very lucrative business, but in order to enter into the swap business, you had to have a AAA credit rating from the rating agencies like Moody's or Standard & Poor. Well, no matter how much the folks at Solomon Brothers tried to wine and dine the credit rating agencies, they could never get above a single A credit rating. And no matter what they did so, they said, you know what, we're not giving up this, uh, we're not giving up the house here. You know what we're gonna do? We're gonna create this special purpose vehicle, this special purpose enterprise. We're gonna call it Swapco. And we're gonna give Swapco, we're gonna we're gonna totally fund Swapco. Okay. We're gonna we're gonna fund Swapco. And Swapco will be able to get that AAA rating from the credit rating agencies. And then we will give the folks at Swapco access to our database of clients all around the world. And they can see these companies like the insurance company and propose all these type kind of swap deals, swap scenarios. And so that's exactly what the folks at Swapco did. And they went to the insurance company and proposed these terms. And then for proposing these terms and structuring the swap, they would charge the insurance company a fee. Now, how much was the fee? In those days when I was in the industry, it would be like a quarter of a basis point, an eighth of a basis point, a 15th of a basis point. Um, it all depended on how much risk was involved. If you got to anything like four basis points, that was considered to be highway robbery. Why? Because again, these, these are all based on a notional principle. And the notional principles were not $10, $10 or $100. We're talking about swaps that were structured in the billions of dollars with notional principles of $3 billion, $5 billion, $10 billion, even maybe $100 million. Even $100 million was considered kind of small. Okay. Now, if, this, if the bond dealer is going to charge half a basis point or a quarter of a basis point, even a basis point on $100 billion or an $80 billion, whatever, that's a lot of money. And it's a, it's a fee that was not paid once like a premium on an option, but it was continuously paid. So obviously, as a result, they were making a lot of money. What was the bond dealer making money from? Structuring the deals. And again, what the bond dealer was doing was the bond dealer would come to the insurance company, offer them the, the terms. The insurance company maybe wanted to get into a contract for five years. The insurance company, the bond dealer would say, well, five years, that's a long time. They would try to find other counterparties to offset the transaction with the insurance company with. So what the bond dealer did is, I just showed this to you with an insurance company, the bond dealer would structure all of these swaps and offset them with multiple parties. And for structuring each one with each party, they would charge these fees. And they were just sitting there going, ka-jing, ka-jing, ka-jing. And just sitting there, they had zero, when they closed their books, when the bond dealer like bond, uh, Swapco closed their books at the end of the day, they had a zero exposure to interest rate risk. And all they were doing was collecting these fees for structuring the deals on a quarterly basis or semi-annual basis, ka-jing, ka-jing, ka-jing. Because again, that's what all investment banks do, right? Or what these bankers do. They charge money for doing absolutely nothing. Just sitting there and collecting these fees. I'm just kidding around. But you get the point. So they were able to structure it this way. And what the bond dealer did is the bond dealer would be sort of like the hub. And then they'd have all these spokes of clients and they would offset these deals. And the bond dealer would never get into a swap unless they knew that they could offset it with multiple parties. And at the end of the day, when they closed their books, they had a zero exposure to interest rate risk. That's the key point. So that was the whole purpose of this plain vanilla interest rate swap. Okay, so hopefully you see from this example how, um, you know, both the bond dealer and the insurance company benefit from this. All right, um, the next example that we need to go over is the currency swap, okay? And if you take a look at your screen for a second, you will now see on a screen here of a U.S. company and a U.K. company and how a currency swap is actually constructed. Now, with a currency swap, currency swaps can be structured as... Fixed for fixed, floating for floating, fixed for floating, or floating for fixed. On the exam, they make life simple, and they pretty much do a fixed for fixed currency swap. They've never really deviated from that, because they figure that if you could do a fixed for fixed currency swap, as, we, as I showed you in the earlier item set problem, fixed for fixed currency swap, you can do floating for fixed, or floating for floating, or uh, fixed for floating. It doesn't really matter. But in this example that I have here, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to show you one of the major motivations for undertaking a currency swap. One of the major motivations for a currency swap is because both parties have a 
Comparative advantage. Ooh, comparative advantage. Remember that term from economics in level one? A comparative advantage, meaning they have a lower opportunity cost in borrowing in their home currency. So the US company has a comparative advantage in borrowing from the US banks in US dollars, and the UK company has a comparative advantage in borrowing in pounds from the UK banks. So each one has a comparative advantage in borrowing in their home currency. Now, technically, if the US company needs pounds and the UK company needs dollars, what could they do? The UK company can go and the US company can both go into the spot markets, into the foreign exchange markets, and convert their pounds to dollars or their dollars to pounds, and they're done. Why do they need to worry about a currency swap or get into all of this involved? Well, because if they go, if, if I have 50 billion pounds and I need dollars and I go into the foreign exchange markets, guess what? I'll take the 50 billion pounds, I'll convert them into dollars, and then when I wanna convert them back into pounds, because that's my home currency, I'm gonna be exposed to foreign exchange rate risk. The, the, the exchange rate between the dollar and the pound could go in, a, in, a, in an adverse manner to my expectations, and I could end up with a lot less pounds than I started out with. So, and th so that is why a lot of people, when it comes to large principal values, don't really want to do this in the foreign exchange markets because it exposes all it exposes all of that principle to foreign exchange rate risk. And that's the key point to understand here. The big motivation again here for entering into a currency swap is to basically take advantage of the fact that each, each, country, each company here, the US company and the UK company, both have a comparative advantage in borrowing in their home currency. And what we're gonna do in the next part is we're gonna go over this entire example and we're gonna work it out and you're gonna see how both parties work in terms of the currency swap. And noticing that with a currency swap, unlike the interest rate swap, in the, inter in the plain vanilla interest rate swap, there is no swap of principal. Here, there's actually going to be a swap of the actual principal. The actual, so it's not truly a notional principal because each of the principals is in a different currency. So there will be an actual swap of currencies. But we're going to pick this up in the next part.